Dysmenorrhea relief with acupuncture or how Chinese medicine can truly help when it comes to menstruation cramps. Today I'm going to share the TCM views on dysmenorrhea, the causes, the TCM patterns, symptoms, including treatments with acupuncture points, herbal formulas, and food. But stay till the end because I also have some really juicy treatment options you're going to love to add to your practice to help your patient. Welcome back to my channel if it's your first time here. Hi, I'm Clara and I create Chinese medicine and acupuncture content for students and practitioners, making it easy to grasp and fun to learn. Let's do this. Dysmenorrhea is a debilitating condition commonly known as menstruation cramps and a lot of women are affected by it and I remember growing up because this happened to me I was told that I was unlucky to have bad cramps and some women don't have cramps and they're lucky. I don't think luck has anything to do with it and because of the bad luck I was told you just have to live with it and then I got some Chinese medicine treatment and I'll tell you all about that story coming up but when it comes to dysmenorrhea there are two types primary and secondary primary dysmenorrhea is what happened to teenage girls when they first get their period so the first two years of the period and it is very common this is exactly what happened to me Secondary dysmenorrhea is when it's associated with another condition like endometriosis, fibroids, or an infection, or anything happening in disorder that's happening to the uterus that's creating menstruation cramps. The symptom of dysmenorrhea can range from very mild to very severe, and it can range from low back pain, lower abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, if the pain is so bad, the woman can vomit being nauseated, it can really take a lot of energy, often the woman can't even get out of bed because she's in so much pain. This affects a woman's life and her ability to live a normal life because I remember when I was a teenager and this happened to me, I could not do sports, I could not do school sometimes for two days every month. This is ridiculous, right? This is not right. So we need to be able to address this and not just brush it as, oh well, you're just out of luck. When it comes to Western treatment for dysmenorrhea, the doctor will recommend either over-the-counter medication or something stronger that can be prescribed, but often they'll be recommending a birth control method, like an IUD or the birth control pill, to try to mitigate or lessen the pain. When it comes to TCM view for dysmenorrhea, we want to look at the root cause and see if we can address it or just manage it. When it is due to external pathogen like cold and damp, which can come from external pathogen but also from diet, something we can totally address. Emotional stress, emotional trauma can also be the root cause, as well as overworked physically and emotionally, and intercourse too often that is quite strong. And when I mean strong, I mean a lot of jarring. That makes sense? Okay, so that's the view of the Chinese medicine perspective when it comes to causes. There can be, of course, if it's due to endometriosis or fibroids, that's a different story because we have to look at the root cause of those disorders. But the pain itself, often when it's not associated with another disorder, comes from having those causes we can look at. Does that make sense? Okay, now we're going to look at the excess and deficiency patterns that are the most common seen in clinical practice when it comes to dysmenorrhea with their symptoms, acupuncture points, and formula. Then I will share with you more options and what else you can do to help your patients. Now let's talk about the different patterns for dysmenorrhea in Chinese medicine. I'm going to start with the excess pattern and I'm going to compare them so we understand how we do the diagnosis so we can have the best treatment. So the first four are going to be chi and blood stagnation, internal cold, damp heat, liver chi stagnation turning into fire. So the last two are excess including heat and the first two don't have excess heat. Specifically when there's chi and blood stagnation it can eventually sometimes lead to internal cold or excess internal cold because when there is no blood circulation eventually internal cold can set in. With the first two because they're both Stagnation. With internal cold, there's always stasis because the cold congeal and stop blood circulation. This is an excess cold or excess yin syndrome. 
So both of them are going to have stabbing pain, strong pain in the lower abdominal area, fixed pain in the uterus area. And it is going to be the day before and the first couple of days of the menstruation. When there is an excess pattern, it is always going to show the day or two before the menstruation and the beginning of the period, not at the end. So they both have that same thing in common. However, there's a few different things. With the chin blood stagnation, we're going to have larger clots, while with the internal cold, we're going to have smaller dark clots. The blood is going to be dark when it comes to blood stasis because blood stasis is purple and pain, right? But with internal cold, it's going to be a little bit more bright red. With internal cold also, it's going to be scanty blood. So not a lot of flow, not a lot of blood. With blood stasis, it could be normal flow. Now, also with blood stasis, there's going to be PMS due to the chi stagnation, specifically irritability, mood swings, and breast distension. With internal cold, we're going to have other symptoms like cold hand and feet or cold lower abdominal area. So when it says cold body, it means body part. When it comes to the tongue, if it's more chi stagnation, it's going to be more pink. If it's more blood stagnation, it's going to be more purple. And the pulse is going to be wiry no matter what, but if blood stasis is really showing, then it'll be wiry, choppy. With internal cold, the tongue's going to be bluish, which is the excess cold showing up. However, it could also be pale. And the reason for a pale tongue is that because when there is internal cold, often it's due to a blood deficiency. As you can see, there's scanty blood as well. So blood deficiency, often the consequences, which could be specifically for women, internal excess cold. So the pulse is going to be tight which is the excess cold, and choppy, which shows more a bit of a blood deficiency. So that's a little bit of the difference. Now let's look at the two excess that contain excess heat. We have damp heat and we have liver cheese stagnation, which turns into fire. Now, if you haven't seen my video on liver cheese stagnation and its consequences, check it out because it explains how and what happened when it can turn into fire or blood stasis or other symptoms when it comes to damp heat and liver cheese stagnation turning into fire, there's a bit of a difference. So again, this is excess pattern. So the abdominal pain on both of them is going to be at the beginning of the period or just prior to. Now, when it comes to damp heat, dampness is heavy, like it's feeling heavy. And there's, of course, excess damp, right, which is going to show as excess, abnormal, vaginal, sticky discharge. It is smelly because there's excess heat as well. And then the person's going to be thirsty. There's going to be dark urine, irritability, a yellow coat with a red tongue. That is all the heat. When it comes to the dampness, it's going to be more of the sticky discharge, the greasy coat, and the slippery pulse. Now, the pulse can also be rapid. It depends on how much heat there is or the person has. Also, burning pain like the pain is burning and it extends to the lower back or the sacrum area and the person in general feels hot so obviously for that person we can't use a heating pad we can't use moxa compared to the two patterns before internal cold and cheese stagnation where we can use a heating pad and moxa that's the difference here this is why diagnosis is so important now, when there is liver cheese stagnation, often the person is a lot of stress. And when it turns into fire, first it'll turn into liver yang rising, which might come down, but eventually it turns into fire. So how does it look like? Again, it is going to show us heat, but worse heat than the one before. And the difference is that heat or fire specifically dries the fluids. So there is going to be dry stool with constipation. The person's going to feel hot all the time. And they're going to be thirsty for cold drink, like ice cold drink. They are going to have anger about mood swings. They're going to be so short fused, very irritable. Also, when there is fire, fire has tendency to rush blood. So there's going to be a heavy period or it's going to be a heavier flow. It's going to be dark blood with small clots. So that's the difference there. And of course, in the tongue, it's going to show as really red with a yellow coat and probably obviously some dryness because again dry coat it will be a dry coat because the fire dries fluid the tongue is going to be red with redder sides because that's the liver area of the tongue and the yellow coat the yellow coat will be very dry 
because the fluid are gonna dry from the excess fire. It may have also some cracks. The pulse is going to be wiry and rapid. Okay, so let's look at treatment. When it comes to formula, each of those formulas are really good to address the area. And basically, usually it's great to take a week before the period, a week to 10 days before the period or past ovulation until the first day of period. This is the best thing to do it. Taorong Sewutong is a modification of Sewutong, which is great when there is a lot of stagnation, but it also nourish blood. Shaofu Juyutong is really specifically for the lower abdominal blood stasis and it's warming. So again, there is a blood deficiency and a blood stasis there. Shaofu Juyutong does not nourish blood, so it does not address the blood deficiency if it's there. When it comes to damp heat, the formula is Qinghe, Tiao Shui Tong. So again, my pronunciation, don't get me on this. <laughs> I'm French, speaking English, and pronouncing Mandarin. What? <laughs> and the last one is Danger Shaoya San, which is a modification of Shaoya San for when there is excess heat. One of the points that has to be there really is splenate because splenate is the she cleft point of the spleen which is in charge of you know moving blood and relieving pain specifically uterus pain so that has to be there for the first one we are going to do spleen four and pc6 and usually i do spleen four on the right and pc6 on the left so you don't have to use four needles using two the less amount of needles the better treatment in my experience liver three to move obviously liver chi spleen six to balance the hormone the reproductive system but also to move chi and move blood stomach 29 because it's really located where the ovaries are and it is the only point that actually warms the uterus and in this instance it is going to cause a excess cold if it continues to be a blood stagnation so this is a really good point to put in there now Spleen 10 is great to also move blood and move cheese specifically for the uterus. So that's a good combination. When it comes to internal cold, we want to add up moxa. I could also do moxa or heat lamp on the first one as well. Often if the patient has some kind of cold symptom somewhere else in the body, I might also add it because it also moves blood. In this instance, we're going to do lung 7 on the right, kidney 6 on the left. Again, less amount of needles the better we're still going to do spleen eight but this time we want to warm the uterus area so stomach 28 we're going to do it which is around the ovaries and ren four ren six we really want to moxa this and i would do moxa on spleen six as well because this is the meeting point of the kidney the liver and the spleen which are all in charge of the female reproductive system as meridians when it comes to damp heat we are going to clear the dampness with spleen nine and ren nine and we are going to clear the heat with large intestine 11. Spleen 10 is also good to move blood, liver 3, move chi, which helps in moving dampness. Because when there's dampness, things are sticky, they don't move as well. So that's why there's clots in that specific pattern. Bladder 32 is also a really good point when there is damp heat in the lower jowl, specifically in the female reproductive system. And long 7 on the right, kidney 6 on the left to balance the reproductive hormones. Good. The last one, we are going to move chi and release the fire. So to move chi, liver three is great, right? Obviously. Also Sanjiao six, because it's great for constipation when there is a lot of constipation due to excess. LI11 is going to clear the heat or the fire. Liver two is going to clear the fire from liver. So that's a really good combination. Spleen eight is going to release the pain. Spleen 10 is going to move as well to get less clots and better flow. REN6 and REN4 are great to add up in the area without moxa, without anything, but just to get some movement. And liver 14 is the front move point of the liver. And because this is a really big liver pattern, it's a great way to add liver 14 for better results. If you're enjoying my graphics so far, they are part of my book, TCM Treatments Made Easy. It is a fantastic guide to have in practice. It covers over 160 syndromes, treatments with acupuncture points, formulas, food, ear acupuncture, and treatment option. The feedback on it has been amazing. Click the link below and get your copy today. I also have the PDF version if you need to as well.
Now let's look at the deficiency pattern of dysmenorrhea. We only have three. Those are the common basic ones. It doesn't mean that there can't be any other, but those are the common ones that I see in clinical practice. Always make your own diagnosis for your patient. This is just a guide as a reminder. So chi and blood deficiency compared to spleen yang deficiency with liver blood deficiency, which I see is very common in clinical practice, and liver and kidney yin deficiency. So those three are the most common one when it comes to dysmenorrhea. Let's look at the symptoms. So one of the thing is the pain itself compared to the patterns before, which were excess and very strong pain, this pain is more a dull ache, it's milder. It's still annoying, it's still constant, it's still really affecting the person, but it won't be as strong. So it's easier to manage, I guess, compared to you know stabbing pain, which makes it very difficult to go about our days. So let's start with the first one, chi and blood deficiency. The pain is very dull, like I said, and it's a hypogastric pain towards the end of the period. So that's another thing that is different. When there is deficiency, usually the pain shows more at the end of the period. So maybe day three, four, and five, if that's the case, the period, let's say it's six days. So it's not the beginning or prior, it's at the end of the period. So that's going to happen on all three of them. With chi and blood deficiency, we're going to have a dragging feeling in the lower abdominal area because it could lead to spleen chi sinking. This is usually a spleen chi deficiency with some liver blood deficiency. So it doesn't show the organ per se, but that's often the case. That's why there's going to be loose stool because that's a spleen chi deficiency, fatigue, pale face, but there's blood deficiency affecting the liver and that's the dizziness. Make sense? Okay. The pain feels better with massage, right? The gentle massage feels good. Compared to the excess pattern, massage makes it worse. We don't want to be touched in the lower abdominal region. We want heat, but we don't want to be touched. This feels so much better with massage in this case right now. And the tongue, of course, is pale. The pulse is weak and choppy because there's chi and blood deficiency. The next one is what would happen if the, this one, chi and blood deficiency, is not addressed. That's the next stage, which is the same thing, except there's worse symptoms or it gets worse. So the pain is relieved by massage, but now we also need warmth because now it's not spleen chi deficiency only, it's spleen yang deficiency. So we still have loose stools and fatigue, but now we have a cold body. The person is cold all the time. They're much more fatigued. They don't have energy physically or mentally. And because there is blood deficiency, there is dizziness, blurred vision, right? And the tongue is swollen because when there's spleen yang deficiency, the tongue has tendency to swell because there's retention of excess fluid because there's not enough yang to move the fluid. The pulse is usually deep and thin. It could be also slow if the spleen yang is very prominent. Make sense? Okay. With the liver and kidney yin deficiency, we're still going to have the dull pain, but at the same time, it is going to be relieved by massage. So same thing. However, we don't want heat on this one because the yin deficiency is going to create some heat symptoms like five center heat. Five center heat is palms, soles, and chest area that feels warm. There's going to be sore lower back, and that's very common with kidney deficiency. And there's going to be blurred vision, maybe irritability. That's the liver coming up. There's going to be scanty red blood, and the reason for that is because when there's yin deficiency, there's fluid deficiency. So we're not going to have a lot of flow. It's going to be pretty scanty. The tongue is going to be red with scanty coat. That is a typical yin deficiency tongue, and the pulse is going to be thin, rapid, same thing, very typical. So let's look at the formulas. Those three formulas are very useful. The first one I love, Shang Yu Tong, for qi and blood deficiency. The second one is very warming, Dong Gui Zhong, Zhong Tong, very warming, which is good because there is a spleen yang deficiency. And the last one, Tiao Gan Tong, is very specific to the uterus and nourishing liver and kidney yin deficiency. Now let's look at the acupuncture points. When it comes to the first one and the second one, we can do moxa for both of them, maybe not on every point, but definitely on REN4. That's always going to be a good bet because chi and blood deficiency will lead to the next pattern, spleen yang 
and liver blood deficiency. So now we're also going to do stomach 36 because it tonified chi and blood. So this is a really good point to have in the first two patterns. They're very common, as you can see, and very similar, right? When it comes to chi and blood deficiency, of course, spleen six on both of them is going to be a good point to add as well. Again, this is a perfect point to balance the female reproductive system. And then you can play with back shoe point, right? Bladder 20, bladder 17. Remember bladder 20 is the back shoe point of spleen because this is a spleen chi deficiency and there is a liver blood deficiency. So the blood deficiency can have bladder 17. You can add a bladder 18 because that's the back shoe point of liver. When it comes to spleen young and liver blood deficiency, I like to really do lung seven on the right and kidney six on the left to really balance the hormones, strengthen the kidney essence, strengthen the hormonal system. Liver eight is a really, really good point when there is liver blood deficiency. So I would add it up. You can add up in the previous one as well. Like I said, you don't have to do all the points. This is just basics. And I just want to explain how I come up with those points. Yes? Okay. The last one is a little bit different because we're going to address the kidney and the liver. So back shoe point of liver, bladder 18, of kidney, bladder 23. And then we can continue with spleen 6. But now we can also add up bladder 54, which is also located in the back and is really good to relieve the back pain or the lower back pain with bladder 32, which is good for the sacrum area or the uterus when there is lower back pain. Kidney three is also really good to nourish kidney, so that I would add it up as well. So now I know often I get this question by students, it's like, well, some of your points are in the front, some are in the back, how do I do this? This is your preference. Your intention with your treatment is what counts. I have tendency to do just one side. Either I do front treatment or back treatment. I don't like to do both sides in one session. So it's up to you. If you like to do both sides in one session, then you can do this. I prefer not to. So my sessions are usually 30 to 40 minutes with the needle. So the patient can really get in a parasympathetic state. So what do I do? I usually use one side. Let's say I do a front treatment. There's a lot of the points that I can't do that are in the back and I'm gonna alternate and adapt to this. And if I'm putting the patient face down, then I can do still spleen six, kidney three, kidney six, lung seven, all those points I still can do, right? So there's not a lot of differences, except that if I'm facing up, I can do back shoe point, for example. I often ask my patients, would you rather face up or face down? And the patient will tell you what they prefer, which helps in the treatment. So it's always listening to your patient and have the right intention in your treatment. Now, if you're not sure, and I know sometimes making a TCM diagnosis is not always easy. So if you're not truly sure, go with the basics. Large intestine four, best point to move blood and relieve pain. Liver three, best point to move chi and relax the body. When there's pain, there's tension, right? That's normal. Spleen eight, the best point for menstruation cramp. That woman can also acupressure at home and you can show them because spleen eight is the chi cleft point of the spleen, making it the best point when it comes to menstruation cramps. Kidney five is also a chi cleft point and it's fantastic for menstruation cramp, specifically when you combine it with spleen eight. And then spleen six, because spleen six is the crossing point of the liver, the kidney, and the spleen, making it a great point to relax the whole uterus area and the reproductive system of the female. So those four points recapping is LI4, liver three, open the gates, spleen eight, kidney five, to relieve the pain, and spleen six, because it's an overall point to try to help women's reproductive system. Now let's talk about treatment option, including food recommendations. When it comes to dysmenorrhea, no matter what the pattern is, Ear acupuncture is fantastic and you can put ear seeds which the patient can stimulate at home which is useful when they can't come and see you as often. So when it comes to ear we want to do liver, spleen, kidney, just like when I talked about spleen six being the crossover of liver, spleen and kidney, this is the same for the ear. All those three will represent the female reproductive system. And then we want to put sympathetic to really calm the body from the pain area. And then we want to add up also the endocrine point to balance the female reproductive hormones in this instance. Now, another one that I like to add is 
On the sacrum, we want to do seven star. Often it's called seven star or a plum blossom. I love that. Little hammer, and then you tap on the sacrum. You're going to tap all along the sacrum with the little hammer, which is called the plum blossom or the seven star. And you're going to do this at least a week before the period every single day. Now, it's not always easy to see the patients every single day, so at least a week, up to a week before the period to do it at least a couple of times will really help. This is also very useful for endometriosis to break down that scar tissue. So I use it for that as well, which we know endometriosis, of course, creates dysmenorrhea or menstruation cramps. Other treatment options are exercise, specifically gentle exercise. We need to relieve the body, relax the body. So relieving stress, and physical exercise. So breathing, meditation technique, yoga, qigong, tai chi, going for walk in nature outside, enjoy the trees, being forest bathing. Very good to calm the mind but move the body. This is very key to help when it comes to dysmenorrhea. Now let's talk about food and teas. The first one is ginger tea, turmeric tea, cinnamon tea, those three, and you can combine them, obviously, those are great for dysmenorrhea. And one of the great drink I like is golden milk. And golden milk is from Ayurvedic medicine, it's from India originally, and I love this drink. It's really soothing, and it's great for dysmenorrhea and menstruation cramps. So start taking it probably a week before the period on a daily basis. Plus, it has so many other health benefits. And then diet. Diet is a huge component of our health because it's the center of our health, specifically spleen and stomach in Chinese medicine. So we need to have a really good digestive system, but also feed the body nourishing and nutrients that is going to help relieve the pain. So avoiding everything that's going to create inflammation in the body, like alcohol, coffee, processed food, sugar, yeah, all those things have to be eliminated. Dairy is usually not a great one, neither gluten for some people as well. Not everybody, depending on the area of the world you live in and many factors. But in general, we want to try to reduce the inflammation and we want to have a lot of omega-3 fatty acid, like salmon, like fatty fish, nuts, seeds are great for that. Avocado, we want to have a lot of really good fat that decrease inflammation and in TCM perspective any spice is going to increase circulation in the body which is fantastic as well. One more treatment option is heat applied like a heating pad or a moxa but that can only be done if the person is blood deficient has blood stasis or is young deficient but not if they have excess heat right if they have excess cold great but if they have excess heat we do not want to apply more heat. Heat brings about circulation, but it's not always good for everyone. So we want to make sure we address the individual every single time. Oh, and watch this video if you want more on how to treat pain, acute specifically, with acupuncture. You're gonna love it. Have a fantastic day. I hope this was useful. There's so much more on my website, resource page, acuproacademy.com. Check it out, and no matter what, keep rocking it. Use it TCM.